All righty. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I'll try to speak up as loud as I can. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for having me this morning. I was very excited when Dr. Shaw asked me to present today. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I, the, the most concerning aspect of, uh, or most anxiety-provoking uh, aspect of presenting today was to try to cram all this information into 20 minutes. And I'm going to do the best that I can. Psychologists are hopefully known as being good listeners, but we also talk a lot too, so bear with me. I'm going to cover a fair amount of ground in a short period of time. Okay, so I have some fairly uh, ambitious learning objectives. What I want to do is essentially define neuropsychology. Dr. Shaw had mentioned that neuropsychological evaluation is um, part of the pre-surgical planning process, and some of you all may be familiar with what neuropsychology is, many of you may not be familiar. And so I'm going to kind of demystify some of the process for you. I'm also going to talk about our current kind of diagnostic system, uh, what some of these diagnoses mean, mild versus major neurocognitive disorder. I'm going to talk about obviously cognitive change associated with Parkinson's disease, what are some of the risk factors. I'm going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. I'm not going to really get into a whole lot of detail, but one of the things that um, is important to know about cognitive change is why some is it, someone, not only what they're experiencing as being different than before, but why those particular types of changes are experiencing within the context, they're experiencing within the context of a particular condition. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of this continuum of Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's dementia, uh, diffuse Lewy body disease. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of uh, detail about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differential diagnoses and, of course, um, psychiatric comorbidities. I know we have a presenter who will be um, sharing some information with us in just a little bit on more of the specific psychiatric changes associated with Parkinson's disease. I would be remiss as a psychologist to not talk a little bit about some psychological, emotional changes associated with Parkinson's disease. And I'll finish by um, referencing some treatment that is often recommended in the neuropsych evaluations that we, provided for, we provide for patients. Okay, so what is neuropsychology? And again, I'm going to try to talk into the microphone, so I apologize if I fade off a little bit. This is a, a fairly long-winded, as I mentioned, psychologists talk a lot. Um, this is a fairly long-winded definition of what neuropsychology is. But essentially, what this is, is this, this is a specialty or a subspecialty within the field of clinical psychology that involves the assessment and, inter and intervention uh, and scientific study of human behavior as it relates to normal and abnormal functioning of the central nervous system. Essentially what we're doing is we're using standardized measures. Standardized meaning we're administering tests in the same way each time to everybody that comes into our clinic and we're using normative reference groups. So we are trying to make determinations as to whether or not someone is experiencing cognitive change within a particular area that is different from where they would expect them to be at this particular stage of life. One of the best sort of um, descriptions of what neuropsychology is that I share with patients all the time, I, I reference MRIs or CT scans or structural imaging that shows a picture of what the brain looks like. Our tests tell us what the brain is capable of doing. Sometimes they're, they're fairly consistent, sometimes they're fairly incompatible, meaning sometimes we will see a patient who has a significant degree of change or atrophy in the brain, but they are functioning qu quite well. The reverse can also be the case, where we will see somebody who is struggling with memory, attention, problem solving, or so on, far beyond where we would expect them to be at this age, although on their neuroimaging, it looks pretty clear. And so we, this is sort of a complement to structural neuroimaging. Um, we pull upon the principles of behavioral neurology, psychometric statistics, um, certainly psychiatry and psychology. Go to the next slide. Okay, so a lot has changed over the years. Um, the field of neuropsychology is still in its relative infancy, um, 50 to 60 plus years. Uh, uh, has been in fo the focus of studying 
cognitive change. And when I'm referring to cognition, I'm talking about thinking abilities. I'm thinking, I'm referencing memory, as I stated, problem solving, mental processing speed, use of language, and, sh and so on. There's been a, a fairly significant shift in our field, and we're actually on the cusp of another fairly significant shift. Way back when, before modern neuroimaging, the role of the neuropsychologist was essentially to identify where in the brain there's a lesion. And so a patient would come into a neuropsychology clinic, and the way that they performed on a particular battery of tests would suggest if there was a certain pathology on one side of the brain versus the other, in the in more anterior regions or posterior regions, well, that changed or the effectiveness of that is altered uh, or was altered, I should say, in the advent of neuroimaging. And so if we have a picture of a brain, a neuroimage, that shows structural changes in a certain area of the brain, and here's the picture, um, that may give the physician all the information they need to know if this is a surgical case or what have you. So the field shifted, and we moved more towards talking about functioning and differential diagnosis. So if someone has a memory problem, does that mean that that particular memory problem is similar to or different than some of the more commonly known causes of changes in memory, such as Alzheimer's disease or what have you? We also focus a lot on functioning, compensation for functioning. So if someone is having significant memory problems, what can we provide as neuropsychologists to help that individual function better day to day? Really, the, the benefit of coming in for an evaluation is not just to quote unquote find out what is wrong, but also what are some things that can be done to help compensate or work around those areas of difficulty. And I mentioned that we're kind of at the, at the uh, cusp of another shift in the field. And that is really because of the advent of um, very sensitive biomarkers, which is becoming um, discussed more in the literature. And it is sort of changing a little bit about what we do. Way back when, when I was in graduate school, I used the example of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease, from a neuropsychological perspective, at least when I was doing my training, was diagnosed at the point of dementia, meaning that someone had progressed past a certain point and there are multiple areas of difficulty in functioning, primarily memory, but some other aspects of change as well. And at that point, the neuropsychologist could say with a reasonable degree of certainty that this looks like a particular condition. This looks like Alzheimer's disease, or maybe this looks like uh, dementia associated with Parkinson's disease. Because of some of these new biomarkers that are being discussed, we are actually at a state right now where somebody could essentially be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease without cognitive impairment, which is kind of um, surprising. Um, it's sort of shocking to think where we've been and where we're going. And so this is uh, another unique time in our study uh, of neuropsychology when we have all these different uh, medical biomarkers that are highly sensitive to disease changes. Next slide. Okay, so what is the purpose of neuropsychological testing? Okay, these are non-invasive uh, approaches to assessing cognitive functioning. We are looking at uh, normal aging versus cognitive change or decline. So one of the things that patients will often say when they come to our clinic is, my memory is just fine. I can remember things from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I'm not exactly sure why I'm here. Now, I can understand that. Um, that's not really necessarily the type of memory that we are concerned about. So we would expect most people to remember, and I'm, and I'm not talking about um, benign information, I'm talking about more significant, memorable information from 20, 30 years ago, anniversaries, what have you. We wouldn't expect that type of memory to change unless somebody is further along in their disease progression. We're more concerned about n learning new information, acquiring new information that's being said to somebody or new information that somebody is coming across in their daily life and their ability to retain that. And so we'll spend a lot of time talking with patients, 
and their families, who are often a good source of uh, collateral information to let us know what are some of the day-to-day -day concerns that this individual is experiencing. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we're using normative references. So somebody may come, all, come to my clinic and say, I don't think that I'm any more forgetful than my neighbor who's the same age, or my brother, or my sister, or what have you. And that very well may be true. And that's going to be something that we're going to take a look at first and foremost. We look at test data, if you will, the information that a patient is giving to us and compare that statistically to where people are at a certain age and come to a clinical conclusion as to whether or not we think that the changes or some of the difficulties that you're experiencing day to day are in fact due to normal aging or if it's beyond expectation for normal aging and we start to consider a specific disease course or specific um, disease etiology. We are doing baseline assessments. So in other words, we're looking at how someone is functioning at a given point in time and then maybe monitoring that over time to see if there's any progression. The, the nature of progression over time is often very informative as to what is causing the change in the first place. So certain diseases, and I'm going to talk about Parkinson's in particular, obviously, in just a, in just a moment here, will behave in a certain way that is characteristic to that particular disease over time. So the change that is seen in thinking associated with Parkinson's disease is different than the change that's seen in Alzheimer's disease. We also um, are involved in research with our uh, psychometric tools, looking at um, efficacy, efficacy studies for uh, uh, drugs such as Aricept and so on. We do pre-surgical and post-surgical evaluations. Uh, Dr. Shaw was talking about deep brain stimulation and referenced the neuropsych evaluation as being part of that process. And he talked about some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And what we are looking at is are some of the non-motor uh, changes that could have some bearing on the decision as to whether or not to pursue deep brain stimulation. So an exclusionary criteria is a severe level of cognitive change, what we will refer to as major neurocognitive disorder, but what many of you have come to know as dementia. We will obviously look at psychological functioning. If someone has very significant uh, and untreated um, depression and anxiety, that can be a contraindication. We will also like to look at post-surgical functioning as well. After somebody has had either deep brain stimulation or a different type of surgical intervention, intervention for a different disease process, we want to see what effect the surgery has had on their cognitive functioning. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do is add a broader scope evaluation beyond a standard mental status exam. As some of you may be familiar with what a typical mental status exam is. You may have gone into your doctor and get a 30-point or 30-question um, assessment of your thinking skills, and that gives an overall estimate of what your cognitive abilities are like. There's a, a fairly well-known neuropsychologist at Northwestern who refers to that as essentially like taking someone's temperature. So if someone has a low score on a, on a mental status exam, it may suggest that you have a fever, essentially. We don't really know why, because it's fairly brief, it's a snapshot in time, and it doesn't allow us to look at each aspect of functioning the way that we may need to to help with a refined differential diagnosis. Okay, so I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Um, in our current diagnostic sim uh, system, we're looking at mild, and then the next slide will be major neurocognitive disorder, but essentially what we mean is with mild neurocognitive disorder, there is evidence of a decline from a previous level of functioning. So that's a really important piece. Now, if you are coming to my clinic, and this is the first time that I've seen you, you may be wondering, why did he say in his report, this is a change from where they were before? How do they know this? Because they've never seen me before. There are certain measures, or then there are certain ways of looking at neuropsychological test data that suggests this is the way someone was probably before, 
and it gives us an estimate of what their baseline abilities were. There are certain aspects of our thinking that just don't change over time. Whether we've had a traumatic brain injury or an acquired brain injury or a neurodegenerative process, for the most part, in the early stages of that disease process, there are certain things that just don't change. And we know that some of those things can give us an estimate of what someone's baseline intellectual abilities are, and we compare that to how they perform in other areas. And so we're looking at a, a decline beyond expectation from aging. Remember I mentioned that we use normative reference group, and they have some impact on daily life. Informants are also very, very helpful as well, as mentioned earlier. Sometimes even the clinicians will say, uh, I'm concerned about John's memory. They appear to be more forgetful in my appointments. That's a sign, that's a symptom that I need to be paying attention to. Now that forgetfulness could be based on a lot of things, and it's gonna be my job to help uh, demystify this process or get a better understanding as what may be causing some of that forgetfulness. Now, essentially, at this level of change, we don't expect independent daily decision-making or what we call IADLs to be affected. So there is some degree of forgetfulness or attention change or language change, but for the most part, someone is functioning fairly well in their daily life. Go to the next slide. Okay, so then the next degree of difficulty is major neurocognitive disorder. In our neuropsychology literature, we don't tend to use the term dementia as much anymore. And there's a number of reasons for why that is. Many believe that it has a fairly negative connotation. Many believe that it's, it's too closely tied to Alzheimer's disease. And we all know that there are many other sources of, or there's many other causes of cognitive disorder disorder or change other than Alzheimer's disease. But what we're talking about when we're talking about major neurocognitive disorder is we're, we're concerned about multiple areas. So it's not just memory or it's not just language or it's not just attention. It's multiple areas of change that are beyond expectation for aging. People are concerned about this level of functioning and it's affecting daily life. And really what we mean by that is it's requiring it, meaning the cognitive change, is requiring someone to need assistance from others to make daily decisions, uh, to manage finances and those types of things. And, and when we're talking about interfering with independence, it's important to point out, especially in a talk or a, in a discussion about Parkinson's disease, we're not talking about the physical functioning getting in the way. We're talking about the cognitive functioning getting in the way, and that's a really important distinction. Now, I will tell you this anecdotally, many of the patients that I see really are kind of in that moderate range, but unfortunately at this point, we, you get two choices, you have either mild or major neurocognitive disorder. So if you see these diagnoses, that's essentially what that means. Go to the next slide. Okay, so we use a standard evaluation. We, uh, within the context of a neuropsychological assessment, we're doing a, a, a fairly lengthy clinical interview. I wanna hear from the patient that's coming to see me, and I wanna hear from their family. A lot of times the informant, the collateral, gives us the best information. Sometimes there's a tendency to not want to say that there is a significant level of concern out of fear of embarrassment, or just being guarded about this. Here is this new person I've never met before. I don't feel comfortable telling them that I'm having all these difficulties in daily life. And that's understandable, and we need to be sensitive to that. We can certainly assume, so let's say I have somebody that's, that's telling me that they're doing well day to day, their family concurrence, oh, we're not as concerned about Joe's daily functioning. That doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a level of major neurocognitive disorder. We will do these evaluations and sometimes the data that we get is sort of a proxy for what people are telling us. In other words, if someone is saying, oh, I'm doing just fine day to day, and it looks as though there's marked significant decline beyond where I would expect someone to be at a particular age, 
I'm going to rely on that data to inform that diagnosis. So that's going to be important to point out. Usually, um, we'll do a record review, two to three hours worth of testing. We're looking at intellect, baseline functioning, memory, language, and so on. One of the things that comes up a lot when patients will make an appointment in our clinic is this four-hour appointment. Oh, my goodness, four hours that just seems so long. And, and I don't blame anybody for thinking that very same thing. What in the world are we going to be doing for four hours? Well, we are going to be keeping you busy looking at your thinking skills. Sometimes we will hear from a loved one say, you know, I just don't think my father, husband, wife could tolerate four hours worth of testing. That is obviously something we need to take in consideration. We will schedule our evaluations for about a four-hour block, but, the, but we will not try to surpass someone's capabilities. Now, that doesn't mean you won't be tired at the end of the evaluation, but if someone is progressed to the point where they are less capable of tolerating a couple hours worth of testing, sometimes the, the actual testing component is very brief. And so we modify those things, we modify our situation um, or our format accordingly. And obviously we have to com accommodate for motor limitations, language limitations, fatigue. Um, that is not uncommon at all. I don't know of anybody that could sit through a four-hour evaluation and not get tired to some extent. So we need to allow for breaks. We need to um, certainly account for motor limitations, tremor, these types of things. If someone has a very significant tremor and they come in for an evaluation, I'm not going to do a whole lot of motor-based tasks because then I'm not, so I'm not so convinced that that low score is a result of changes in your thinking rather than the changes in the primary motor functioning. Go next, next slide. Okay. Um, so within uh, a movement disorder setting, we are looking at um, a lot of different aspects of the patient's clinical history or clinical story. So we want to find out when these symptoms of cognitive change began. That's very critical um, as far as our differentials are concerned. We want to find out about psychological influences. Whether we realize it or not, if we're feeling anxious, if we're feeling sad, that's going to affect our thinking, and that's an important consideration that we need to pay attention to. Um, we also want to understand what degree of awareness does the patient and the family have as far as their cognitive change and what effect it's having on their daily life. We want to monitor functioning over time. As I mentioned earlier, um, the way that a disease behaves over time is often very informative as, to, as far as what is causing that condition. So we know that change, changes in thinking in Parkinson's disease will look a certain way over a period of time. And I want to take a look and see if there is a typical progression that would be expected in the context of, say, for example, idiopathic Parkinson's disease, or if we see the emergence of another condition that's coming along as well. If a patient comes back to me after a year and they have very significant, disproportionate memory problems, uh, then I, I certainly may want to consider another co-occurring condition. And then, of course, I mentioned pre-surgical assessments just a moment ago. And we'll move through these, through these uh, slides pretty quickly. I think I'm already getting this sign that I'm running a little low on time. Okay, I knew that was going to happen. All right, so let's uh, get into some of the, the specifics here. So cognitive change occurs about 20 to 40 percent over the course of Parkinson's disease. Um, certainly the, the rates of, although I mentioned dementia not being a term we typically use as much anymore, um, dementia does increase, uh, the risk for dementia decrease, it increases over time over the progression of the condition. Uh, there are certain risk factors for cognitive change. Um, age, usually a later onset of Parkinson's symptoms would put some at a greater risk for, for cognitive change. Um, early gait dysfunction, a non-tremor dominant presentation usually is associated with higher cognitive change. Um, I also want to comment on just a couple things here um, that, it, that are important to think about. The prodromal phase, so in other words, the symptoms that exist before the disease has presented itself fully. 
um, can also accompany some cognitive changes. More specifically, REM sleep disorder, we see a greater um, degree of executive functioning and attention problems, and uh, changes in smell, we sometimes see with greater language and memory decline. Go to the next slide. Okay, so generally speaking, when we are looking at changes associated with Parkinson's disease, we're looking at difficulties initiating behaviors, or initiating activities, problem solving difficulties, uh, slowed mental processing speed, um, visual spatial changes, so difficulties kind of judging where things are in the room in the space around you. Um, there is sometimes difficulties with generating words and conversations. Um, we certainly see memory changes, but their memory changes look just a little bit different than what we would expect in other conditions. And I'm going to go to that in just a minute. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this side, but suffice to say that the areas of the brain that are involved in the motor symptoms are also those that are responsible for the changes in cognition and thinking. So our pathways um, associated with the deep nuclei within the brain and the frontal lobes, also the parietal lobes, and also those neurotransmitter changes that have already been discussed up to this point. Okay, so as I'm kind of running out of time here, I want to talk a little bit about memory because generally speaking, most people will come to the clinic and reference memory change as being the primary concern. And that can mean a lot of different things. Sometimes if there's a primary language problem, people will say, I'm having trouble remembering words. Or if there's a difficulty with what's called apraxia, I'm forgetting how to do something. Most, the, most of the time, memory is sort of the, the most common reference point. And what's, what's interesting about memory change associated with Parkinson's disease versus a different kind of neurodegenerative condition, like Alzheimer's disease, is the way in which information is retained and then stored and then pulled back up later for later usage. And I like to use this bookshelf analogy. Um, when we think about Alzheimer's disease as a predominant memory disorder, we think of, I'd like to talk about this bookshelf analogy or, or essentially putting information down in a book. So we have to write down the information on the piece of paper, we close the book, we put it in a shelf, and then when someone asks us about it later on, we go to where it existed on the shelf, we pull that information up and find the page. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, there's difficulty, essentially, if you, if you believe the analogy, of getting that information down on the piece of paper, putting it in the right place, and an and inability to access that information from the book. So kind of it all steps along the way. In Parkinson's disease, it's a little bit different. The information may get down, but it may be put in the wrong place on the shelf. Or maybe when there's a cue, don't you remember we talked about that, there may be some difficulty with accessing where that information was put on the shelf or bringing the right book up. It may not necessarily mean that that information's gone, per se, but there may be some difficulties with accessing that information. And that is certainly a little bit more unique to movement disorders in comparison to some of other, our other disease conditions that affect memory. Okay, I'm gonna skip past um, these slides. Okay. Uh, biomarkers, as I mentioned earlier, there's some indication from uh, uh, these uh, structural images and uh, CFS biomarkers, DAT scans, uh, that can predict cognitive change down the line. We'll skip in the interest of time. And then here is just a sort of depi depiction of looking at um, cortical, which is um, typically the types of changes that we see with Alzheimer's disease, versus subcortical, which is typically what we see with Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's plus syndromes. We'll skip. I think we're going to go all the way down to the, the treatment. So we'll go to the last slide. Okay. So jumping uh, ahead here, what do we do? And as I mentioned earlier, the objective is to not just talk about what has changed or what the problems are, but what can we do about managing these symptoms. I, um, we've got some providers here today that can talk about the neuropharmacy, uh, looking at um, 
uh, anti or, uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors uh, for neuropharmacy to help with, with cognitive change. We want to think about mood management. As I mentioned earlier, mood can have a significant effect on our thinking skills. Cognitive rehabilitation. The, the literature is a little mixed on the benefit of cognitive rehabilitation, but I think probably what makes the most sense is to focus the treatment not necessarily on restoration of abilities, but compensation. So in other words, if someone comes and tells me that they have problems with memory, if they are using something on their phone, an adaptive device, something to help prompt them when to do something, remember to remember, functionally, well, maybe not um, neurologically, but functionally, your memory has already improved because you have some sort of device to prompt you. And there are many, many um, different types of software that exist, um, but there's also some very simplistic kinds of things that can be modified within the home setting to compensate for somebody who's got thinking change. And lifestyle management. Sometimes it's a, it's a matter of prevention, um, avoiding the things that are going to get someone into trouble. In other words, if someone is having difficulty making higher level decisions about their personal finance, health, and well-being, it may not be uncommon in a neuropsych evaluation for me to suggest that they may uh, benefit from having a family member, a trusted individual, help make those decisions, appointing a power of attorney, and sometimes even a guardian. Kind of circling back to the, um, the uh, pre-surgical evaluation, that is really an important element of the evaluation as well, the decision-making ability. So can someone make an informed decision about this process is something that we should not overlook. Um, and I think I'm probably out of time. Again, I warned you, I probably was going to have trouble staying on track, but that's the information that I have for you.